strategies to conquer the chaos in your business. And we've divided these in our book into two different sections, mindset strategies and then system strategies. And I, I can't emphasize enough how critical it is that you have both of these figured out. Mind, the, getting your mind straight is a tremendously important part of this. Let's start out by talking about the first mindset strategy that we talk about in Conquer Chaos, and that is what we call building your emotional capital. Now, um, it's not uncommon for people when they start a company to think very, very seriously and specifically about funding. Do they, are they capitalized well? Um, and you know they go out and make sure they've either raised capital or find investors or they're using their savings or whatever. But it's not the case that entrepreneurs come in recognizing this emotional bank account that needs to be built up. And it, it's challenging. Entrepreneurship, you know, the, the stuff that gets taken out of us, the withdrawals, if you will, the emotional withdrawals, are daily, nonstop. And, and from a mindset perspective, it's something you have to be prepared and be intentional about and what that means is you do things very specifically to build up your emotional bank account. And I had an interesting experience recently. I had somebody who is very close to me start a company. And this is somebody who's, who's known about entrepreneurship and known about the principles um, of it and coached, even coached entrepreneurs on those principles. But what, what happened is he started his company, and I was very close to, to him as he was doing this. I saw firsthand the experience of going from the comfort of being with a whole bunch of other people to going out on his own and just being flat out alone. And it is it was it was a very real poignant reminder to me about what that's like to be alone. And, you know, there's a great benefit to it. Alone means I have the control and the freedom, but alone means I'm also means I'm alone. And so a few strategies that I would suggest to people to build up your emotional bank account, your emotional capital is number one you need to talk to other entrepreneurs. You need to get around these other weird people like you who understand the challenges and who can, who can help you. And, you know, we've, we talk a lot about the mastermind concept. And, you know, for some it might look like getting five people in your local area who you meet with once a month. You come together. You share lessons you've learned, challenges you've got going on. Um, a lot of people use this group to create accountability. So if you don't already have something like that, I would I would – urge you to arrange some type of mastermind. It could even be over the phone if you're concerned about kind of local competitive pressures. Um, connect with some people online and have a very regular place and way for people to connect, for you to connect with them. Second is read books. I didn't read a lot of books when we started this company. Um, but, but Clayton and I, we started by reading The E-Myth and we read, we read some other books initially and I got completely on fire. There are just, reading books gives you raw material that will help you to grow your company, and um, you can learn from the lessons that a whole bunch of other people have done. So read a lot of books. Read inspirational stories. Um, the next one is allow yourself to dream. One of, the, one of the things that I find most meaningful that Michael Gerber gave us, in addition to the book, The E-Myth, was he helped us recognize the purpose part of what we were about, and he helped us to recognize that for us to succeed, we needed a dream that was much larger than what we had at the time. And so, you know, his argument is people often will fail, not because their dream is too big, but because it's too small. And so create. If you don't feel like you have a long-term vision and purpose of what's the meaning behind what you're doing, stop going through the motions and set a dream for yourself that will give you the energy that you need. It'll, you'll find that it really increases your emotional capital. Um, another thing is reward yourself. Man, you know, you have the freedom. Let's use it. You know, it might mean that one day you decide, you know what, we are taking the day off, folks. Let's go home. And you do it and, and realize that not everything is going to die and not everything is going to blow up. Do, do things to reward yourself. Be creative. You know, I can't, I can't tell you how many little things we've done here at our company. Um, like last month, we decided we are going to buy a, um, a juice machine. We went out and bought a Vitamix, you know, like these little powerful um, blenders. And it was a simple reward that at our company really kind of helped to boost people up. And now they go in there and they make these shakes. And I don't know, that's just kind of a little example. But be creative about it, you know. And find out what will build your capital the most and go attack it. And then probably most importantly is you've got to get good at monitoring yourself, what we call your self-talk. Don't allow voices in your head to spiral you down. And it might mean that sometimes you've got to go jump in the car and drive around the neighborhood and breathe deeply. Um, but you've got to be in control of what's going on in your mind, okay? All right, let's talk next about the concept that, that uh, we call practicing disciplined optimism. 
Now, this isn't uh, this isn't as simple as uh, you know. Let's just turn lemons into lemonade and and make sure make everything feel like it's peachy and something like that. And it's not just about saying those types of things. Here, here's what we mean by this concept of disciplined optimism. Number one, you have to start with an undying belief that your business is going to achieve success, that the success that you've envisioned as part of your dream. You have to have that confidence. You don't know how you're going to do it, but you know that it's going to happen and you maintain that confidence. And the second thing is, you are, and this is critical, you are willing to confront the brutal facts of your current reality. You stare them right in the eyes and this is kind of where we, where we part from a traditional view of optimism. You have got to be totally willing to open up the nasty stuff that's in your business and just look at it and feel it and get dirty and realize, okay, what is actually going on here? What is, what is broken? And let's get it right on the table. And, and then the third thing is you take those brutal facts and you attack them with vengeance. So let me, let me give you a quick example of how we do that at Infusionsoft. Um, at Infusionsoft, we have a whole bunch of small business customers that we serve, and we deliver software to them. And you know, a lot of people will, when, when they have customers, they don't enjoy interacting with the frustrated customers. We've actually looked at it as a completely opposite thing. We totally embrace our frustrated customer experiences that people have. And so we have a, a customer survey that goes out, and we ask customers exactly what they think of what we're delivering to them. And when we get those results, we do a couple of things that are very key. Number one, we get, the, we get the raw results that come back from our customers, and we put them up on a big projector up on the wall constantly. They're just sitting there going. So when visitors come in, they see it. All the employees see it. And we don't just pick out the good, the nice flowery ones, which there are a ton of those, but we put the nasty grabs up there too. I'm so frustrated that da 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 and it's sitting right there up the wall, on the wall for everybody to see. And some people come in, they're like, well, why are you, that's like, why are you doing that? That's stupid, you know, and we, and we recognized, though, long ago that that's one aspect of us facing the brutal facts of our current reality and calling it what it is. And, and I feel like because of that, we've been able to have a much, much clearer vision of where we're falling short, and then we can go and attack it. The other thing is we call these customers. We call the ones who are totally frustrated and ready to, ready to, you know, we look at it as an opportunity to reach out and really understand where we're falling short. So that's just one simple example. But in general, I just want to encourage you to have, you've got to have this willingness to stare these things in the eye and then just go and attack them. But all the while, you know that you're going to achieve it. Jim Collins, in one of his books, he talks about some prisoners of war who had a similar um, outlook on the way that they they kind of got through the whole experience. And one of the guys who was actually a general that he talked about, he, he talked about the guys who didn't make it. And what would happen is they would they would be, they were kind of a traditional optimist, and they'd be like, all right, I'm getting out by Easter. And Easter would come, and they didn't get out. Well, I'm going to get out by, and, and, and so they were always just, you know, certain that they were going to get out by this time. And they ended up just going bonkers and not making it. And he said, Instead, for us, we had to have this undying belief that we were going to get out, but we still were willing to, to embrace the current reality that we were in. And we didn't live you know, from this milestone to this mile. There's, there's kind of a, there's an underlying belief that has to be there that we're going to achieve. We don't know how we're going to do it, but heck, we're entrepreneurs, and we're going to make this thing happen one way or another. Okay, so, uh, so moving along, let's talk about the next mindset strategy. This is, this is, a, this is a fun one. Um, Asserting your entrepreneurial independence is very important. For those of you who've been in business five years, you know exactly what I'm talking about here. Everybody that you talk to, not everybody, many people that you talk to about your company will have an opinion. Your employees will have an opinion. Um, your family members will have an opinion. All these people are going to have these opinions. And the challenge is if you sit there and listen to every opinion that everybody has, you are going to just go crazy. It's going gonna, it's gonna to just add to the chaos. Part of owning a business is the willingness that you have to, to make to make decisions, to develop your gut so that you can make these decisions quickly, and then just put everything behind you and attack without second guessing. And, you know, Clay, Clay has been a really great mentor for me in this regard because he recognizes that it's not the decisions that we make that are the most important thing. It's how we react to the decisions that we make. You know, a lot of people get let perfect get in the way of good. And, you know, we have a saying around here that version one is better than version none. And, you know, it, it, sometimes it means you're going to just make mistakes, but that's part of the evolution of growing the company and being more successful. 
So, so assert the, your entrepreneurial independence and realize that you know, your, your ability to make those decisions is key. And by the way, this is helpful for those of you who work for entrepreneurs as well. You've got to realize that at some point in time, you're going to be frustrated as heck and screaming mad at, at the, guy who started the, the guy or gal who started the company. And, and you're going to be frustrated that they had to make that decision. But part of, what, part of the weight that they're feeling and that they're bearing is that they've got to make these decisions so that the progress can be made. And so I'm not, I'm not arguing for a company environment where the business owner or the managers make every decision that they don't, give, they don't give ownership down. That's not what I'm talking about. But there are times when decisions need to be made and made quickly and so that everybody can move forward. So it's about this independence. Another thing is that sometimes you just flat out have to say no. And, you know, entrepreneurship, and many, I, I've heard many, many people say, that saying no is actually a more important skill than being able to say yes. You know, there's, if you stopped and thought right now about how many projects you're on that are just flat out not profitable, that are not, uh, you know, that are draining energy that should be diverted elsewhere, then, you know, that's, and that, and in fact, I would encourage everybody after this call to sit down and make that, make a no list and say, what am I doing today that I just shouldn't be doing? What are my employees doing that, I sh that they shouldn't be doing? And just develop that list. It's an extremely empowering experience to do that. And that's part of your entrepreneurial independence. You're like, you just can say, you know what, we're not going to do that, and we're going to go here. You'll be amazed at what kind of life that breathes into the, into the company as people are like, oh, great. So the three hours I was going to spend in that meeting to prepare for that thing that we're not quite sure about, I don't have to do that anymore, great. I can now focus my attention on something else that's much more important. Um, also part of saying no is actually saying no to the wrong kinds of customers. And, you know, sometimes, sometimes you, your business will be extremely jeopardized by having the wrong type of customers. And it's really easy to be, we're going to talk a second about the system strategies that really help to grow. But if you're in a situation where you're not, you're not feeling like you're in a strong marketing and sales and growth perspective, you might be willing to say yes to everybody. And, and that's how many businesses decide, end up dying. They're, they're trying to grow sales, but they're growing the wrong sales. And so we'll talk more about how having options will help it be easier to say no, but that's another great way for you to be saying no. Okay, so let's, let's flip over to uh, the system strategies that I think are just absolutely critical. So the first one is centralizing and organizing. Now you might be asking, why are, you, why are you saying that? It sounds like kind of a basic concept. Or, well, let me, let me kind of tell you a story that I think will help you understand the perspective that I'm coming from. So we were... This is back in our old hallway office, and uh, actually, I'm going to pause here for another story that's totally unrelated, but I think it's kind of funny. So we're sitting around one day, and we hear this rap at the door, and we go out there, and we're like, and nobody ever came, so we were <laughs> we were excited. We had visitors, so we went out there, and it's these two police officers, and they're looking very suspicious, or you know, just kind of on edge, and and uh, we're like, oh, how you how you doing? How can we help you? Well. So after the interchange, I found out we found out they had they they had suspicions that we were running a meth lab in our office. And we're like, what on earth? Well, apparently they had they had reports of strange smells and activity at all hours of the day that were coming from that office. So they uh, they had to come check it out. And luckily, we were not running a meth lab. And uh, anyway, that was kind of a funny thing. So on another day, we're sitting around the office and the phone rings. And again, when the phone rang, we picked it up because we needed to. We need to get business. And this other guy, this guy on the other end of the line, he, he blurts out to Clay. Clay was our star sales person and our sales. He's now the CEO of the company, but he was like the sales team and the janitor and the everything everything but the programmer. Um, and he says, hello. And the guy says, I have pain. Can you help me? And Clay was like, uh... All right. He didn't know if this was one of our customers that we had, you know, messed up something on, or if he was it was somebody. Else. Anyway, it turns out this guy was a prospective customer, and he was a marketing coach. And he came to us because he just had, I think, the actual reason that he came to us. He had a kind of a botched promotion where he sent out a promotion to all of his customers, and it was this half-off deal. You know, I was like, hey, you know, my product is now half-off. Click, you know, go go here to respond. Well, the problem was he sent this out to his entire list of people who had just paid full price. So you can imagine there was a lot of pain coming from what he had, he had just done. Well, the reason that he did this is because he was completely disorganized. He, when it came down to it, we brought all of his systems together. He had one.